uh, trickling in as we move forward. We don't want to uh, wait any longer. Uh, what we're going to do just a second is uh, go to Facebook Live, which I think we're doing right now. Uh, I'll, I'll give a little brief introduction. And if there's anything that you'd like to add to that, that um, he, uh, before you, you begin your presentation, we're um, really interested in this today. I think, uh, I think we're, we've been looking forward to it. So um, first of all, welcome everyone and welcome everybody who is uh, with us on Facebook Live. And a couple of people are going to be in the Zoom link as well. Um, today we welcome uh, Professor Mari Jorstadt and Mari is the academic dean at Vancouver School of Theology, a position that she just recently uh, took on. And so we're so pleased that you, in the midst of what must be a very uh, challenging time, uh, have graced us with the opportunity of, of being with us this morning. One of the things um, about uh, Mari also is that many of us um, know Professor Ellen Davis, who was with us uh, when we read her book, um, uh, of course, I'm blocking on it. Um, the Bible, Culture, and Agriculture. What is the exact title? Scripture, Culture, and Agriculture. Right. Scripture, Culture, and Agriculture. Um, Mari is one of, of Ellen's students. Um, and so we have sort of like the next generation coming with us today um, it, of folks who are interested in both the Bible and um, ecotheology. And um, some of your work is so interesting, Mari, and I'm sure you will be talking. I know that you're going to be talking to us about the prophet Elisha uh, today, which is a really interesting take on all of this. Um, we have at least one attorney with us today who's also really interested in, in um, discussions of personhood um, and the law. And so um, maybe you'll get into that somewhat as well. So um, but we thank you so much for being here. And with no further ado, we will turn it over to you. If there's anything that I've missed of your, in your introduction that you'd like us to know about you, um, we'd love to uh, hear about it. The only thing is sort of a practical note. So I have a toddler and a 10 month old and um, there may be interruptions. <laughs> it's, okay. it's all, they're very cute, but um, the whole idea that I you know, do things they don't participate in, they yeah, struggle we, with it. We're okay with that. <laughs> so, okay. Well, so then I will just go to my talk. And then I thought, you know, afterwards, um, you can just ask questions. And I realized that I have not actually timed myself, which I know no one wants to hear anyone say ever. So I don't think it's um, overly long, but if you're like, okay, we need to move on, just tell me and I won't be offended. Okay. Okay. Great. So We'll have Kelsey send you a text. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, oh, I should turn on my... Uh, um, Yes, I don't actually know that I have my phone with me. Anyways, okay. So I'm going to talk to you. Do you have today. slides today, by the way? Do you, I do not. Okay, no. okay. Um, I'm just, I'm just going to talk. <laughs> so you're just going to have to make pictures in your mind. Um, so um, I tell people, and I'm only kind of joking, that um, the topic of my dissertation, hold on, I actually need to move things around a little bit. There we go. The topic of my dissertation um, was in the Bible, trees are people too. Um, it would be more accurate to say that trees are persons too, but it doesn't sound as good as people. Um, and my dissertation wasn't about trees in particular, but about all kinds of creatures, everything except humans and animals. Um, and I'm gonna give you an overview of the relevant parts of that argument later. Um, but for now, um, I would just like to place what we're talking about today in relation to that work, because I think it's helpful. So in my dissertation, I dealt with texts that are straight up strange by today's standards. Trees clap their hands, stars go to war, fields mourn, rains bring righteousness. I focused on texts in which other than animal nature, anything that is not human or animal, clearly do or feel things beyond what we tend to think other than human nature can feel or do. Today, I'm going to look at you, look at, look with you at a series of texts that are a lot less spectacular and that have a reputation in biblical studies for being a bit boring. Um, we're going to look at Elijah's miracles. The reason biblical scholars have deemed these boring is that they look small next to Elijah's miracles. Elijah deals with kings and armies and affairs of state. Elijah deals with pumpkin stew. Elijah calls down fire from heaven. Elijah makes an ax head float. 
Though Elijah technically performs more miracles than Elijah, scholars have tended to think Elijah's miracles better in terms of quality and just sort of oomph. Um, I want to talk about Elijah's miracles today because the things that make them boring uh, to people are also things that make them interesting in terms of environmental ethics. And though the miracles have no clapping trees or morning fields, I will draw on the field of animism, which is what I used in my dissertation, in order to make clear the miracles usefulness for ethics. If looked at through the lens of animism, the smallness of Elijah's miracles um, is no longer a problem, but a clue to their importance in the book of Kings and to what they can teach us today. So before we get there, um, just a little bit about what I mean by animism. Uh, Graham Harvey, a religious studies um, scholar, describes animism or animists as people who recognize that the world is full of per persons, only some of whom are human, and that life is always lived in relationship with others. The two parts of this definition are equally important. First, humans are not the only persons in the world. Other beings, including animals, plants, boulders, rivers, mountains, and so on, are also potentially persons with their own lives, perspectives, needs, obligations, and powers. Second, relationships extend beyond our own species. Humans do not only relate with other humans. Social relationships and social obligations pertain to relationships among humans, between humans and animals, humans and plants, between animals and other animals, between firs and cedars, bears and salmon. Humans may not have access to knowledge of all these relationships, but they are there and must be taken into account when humans act in the world. Graham's definition of animism differs from earlier definitions of animism. So for example, Edward Burnett uh, Tyler, um, one of the sort of most famous early anthropologists, defined animism as belief in personal souls animating even what we call inanimate bodies. Um, Tyler's definition focuses on the relationship of spirit and body and treats the two as distinctly different. Souls animate bodies that without those souls are inert. Tyler's definition is silent on the relational ethics of animism. The point of the de definition is the internal relationship between body and soul, not between the many kinds of persons who inhabit the world. And Tyler's definition of animism is not particularly useful for thinking about Elijah. Elisha, I have a very hard time distinguishing them in terms of sound. So I'm just generally talking about the one with the S, not with the one with the J. Asking whether the waters, stones, stews, and ax heads that show up in these stories are animated by souls does little to illuminate the text. I suspect that is because the question would have made no sense to the communities that pass these stories on. What the stories are interested in are the relationships between humans and the land, or more specifically, between the ruling elite of Israel, its kings, the prophetic community around Elijah, the various food plants that they rely on for life, water, and everyday materials like ax heads. The Elijah cycle is interested in all the everyday relationships an average Israelite would have participated in, the ways in which those relationships have been undermined or damaged by the kings who ruled at the time, uh, the Amrites, and the ways in which Elijah is able to restore and heal relationships. Okay, so that's animism. And now, where do these stories fit um, in Kings? So the book of Kings, like the first and second Kings, the whole thing, um, is placed within the stories of the decline of Israel and Judah. More specifically, um, Elijah, uh, his stories take place during the end of the house of Ahab. Uh, the Deuteronomic historian, which is what scholars call the author or authors of Kings, has nothing good to say about Ahab. In 1 Kings 1630, we learn that Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any who came before him. 
the Deuteronomic historian is concerned both with Ahab's religious apostasy and with his exploitation of the people. The story of Naboth's vineyard in 1 Kings 21 neatly encapsulates Ahab's failings. Using a religious gathering as pretext and enlisting false witnesses, Ahab has Naboth killed so he can steal his vineyard. Within this context, Elijah's miracles point to what life under normal circumstances should look like. Normal life is one in which Israel's leaders adhere to Deuteronomy's prescriptions for a king, and in which the people as a whole adhere to their covenant with God. According to Deuteronomy, this kind of life is both wonderful and modest. When Israel and Judah adhere to the covenant, the whole land, humans, animals, plants, and soil, is healthy. In Deuteronomy, the main covenant promise is a triad of blessing. Blessed will be the fruit of your womb, the fruit of your soil, and the fruit of your animals. That's Deuteronomy 28.4. If Israel fails to uphold the covenant, there is a corresponding curse. Cursed will be the fruit of your womb, the fruit of your soil, the increase of your cattle, and the young of your flock. And that's in 28.18. At its crescendo, the curses will lead to a famine so severe that parents will eat their own children. You will eat the fruit of your womb, the flesh of your sons and daughters. That's in 28.53. So things get bad pretty quickly in Deuteronomy. The main expression of blessing is a steady supply of offspring for humans, animals, and plants. The whole land experiences blessing together. The opposite of blessing isn't just absence of offspring, but desperation so severe that people will literally eat their own future. One of the saddest and most disturbing stories in Kings is the story of 2 Kings 6, in which two women make a pact to eat their children. I can think of a few darker moments in the Bible, which to be fair, has its share of darkness. So these two states of the land, the triple blessing and the triple curse, involve the active participation of the whole land. When the land is fruitful, the biblical authors describe this fruitfulness as the effort and generosity of all creatures. The land carries its inhabitants, trees carry fruit, the trees and the land give their increase and their strength. Um, and an example of this is Joel 2, 21 to 23, um, which is a promise of restoration. Um, and it's a good example of what a healthy land community looks like. Do not be afraid, of, O animals of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness will be green, for the trees will carry its fruit, and the fig and the vine will give their strength. O children of Zion, rejoice and be glad in the Lord your God, for he has given you the early rain for righteousness, and he has brought down on you rain, early rain and later rain, like before. Rain and fruit, these are promised to humans and animals so that they can eat. Each creature by its life enables others to live. It is the network of life in which everyone contributes. Um, some creatures though are especially important. Rain, for example, is a precondition for all other creatures to live. But in the end, the health of the land community depends on everyone. One of the most poetic expressions of this link of interdependence is found in Hosea, in which God promises to set in motion a creation-wide call and response. On that day, I will answer, says the Lord. I will answer the heavens, and they will answer the earth, and the earth will answer the grain, and the vine, and the wine, and the oil, and they will answer Jezreel. Uh, Jezreel is a valley in Israel, or Palestine. Okay. So that's context. So animism on the one hand, and then where do these stories fit in Kings and in the larger sort of Deuteronomic um, context? I'm sorry, there's a bird that keeps visiting me on my balcony. So we've got a bird participant. Okay, so now we're gonna fo fo focus on Elijah's miracles. The Deuteronomic vision of blessing and curse um, is really important for understanding Elijah's miracles. Um, and it's also the blessings and the curses relate directly to the critique of royal power found throughout Kings. Elijah's miracles connect the two. So the Deuteronomic blessings and curses and the critique 
of the monarchy in order to show a different way to live in the land. Um, so you can think of it almost as a Venn diagram. So you've got like Deuteronomy, blessing and curses, critique of royal power, and Elijah is the thing that sits in the middle. A story that illustrates this connection or contrast is this um, is the Elijah's second miracle in 2 Kings 2. It's a lot of twos. This miracle in which Elijah heals a water source sets the direction for his ministry. So this is a story. The people of the city spoke to Elijah. Notice the setting of the city is good, as my Lord can see. The waters are bad and the land is bereaved. He said, get me a new vessel and put salt in it. They got it for him. He went out to the spring of the water and he threw salt into it. He said, thus says the Lord, I have healed these waters. No longer will death and bereavement come from them. The waters have been healed until this day, according to the word Elijah spoke. A key word in this passage is the word for bereavement or miscarriage from the root shakal. It can refer to miscarriage, the loss of children, whether young or adults, loss during war, or loss of agricultural fertility. It is the loss of the three kinds of fruits seen in Deuteronomy's promises, the fruit of your womb, the fruit of your soil, and the fruit of your animals. In 2 Kings 2, the reason for this loss is a bad water source. The waters themselves are described as bad, rayim. Rayim can denote anything from something of low quality to something evil. And it is the same word that describe Ahab's deed. Ahab, just to remind everyone, is the, the king that Elijah um, kind of flashes with. The king is evil, and now the waters are somehow evil or bad too. Rayim is a very common word in the Hebrew Bible. Just in Kings, it occurs 41 times. Of these, 37 occurrences describe either the people or the kings, usually the kings, doing something that is evil in the sight of the Lord. Of the remaining four, two are from the story of the prophet Micaiah, whom the king of Israel complains only prophecies bad, Reim, thinks about him. This leaves us with two other occurrences, both of which are from the stories of Elisha. One is the story we are talking about now, the waters are bad. And their badness is no small thing. It spreads sickness, death and bereavement come from them. When Elijah fixes the waters, the process is described as healing. It is the same word used for the healing of human wounds, be it through prophetic intercession or by a physician. A physician is called a, a healer, again, using the same word. Um, and it's tempting to read this miracle as kind of plumbing issue. Um, Elijah is the sort of like, miraculous plumber. Um, but Elijah's miracle is not technical, it's relational. And Elijah's actions are unique within the book of Kings. King after King is described as doing what is evil in the eyes of the Lord. Elijah is the only character within all of Kings who restores something that is bad to health. This healing or restoration, as I just said, is relational. In contrast to the bad Kings, whose rule spreads bad relationships. Elijah's miracles heal relational networks that include and extend beyond human relationships. In the Elisha cycle, God's power is expressed through the prophet's ability to write relationships and to live within them. Ahab lives within a world where um, royal power trumps all other things. If Ahab wants a vineyard, Ahab takes it with no respect for the multi-generational relationships that he is destroying. Elijah lives in a different world where leadership is expressed by healing broken relationships and by reestablishing the lines of dependence that tie together the triple blessing of Deuteronomy, the fruit of your womb, the fruit of your animals, and the fruit of your soil. Elijah's other miracles also restore relationships and show what life is supposed to look like for God's people. Um, and we're just going to, there's a whole bunch of them, so we're just going to look at a few. Um, we're going to look at 2 Kings 4, uh, which contains four miracles. The miracle of the oil, the birth, death, and resurrection of a son, the miracle of the poisonous stew, and the miracle of the barley loaves. 
Um, in the first miracle, a member of the prophetic community has died and his wife calls out to Elijah. Creditors have come for her two children to take them as slaves. In response, Elijah asks her a question that at first seems a bit besides the point and also a bit rude. What am I to do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? Um, that's in 2 Kings 4 to you. The woman answers that she has nothing. That's why she's in this situation in the first place, except a jar of oil. Elijah tells her to gather vessels from her neighbors, not a few, um, and to fill them with oil from their jar. This she does. The oil is plentiful enough that she can repay her debt and she and her sons can live on the remaining oil. In the sec second story, a Shunammite woman has been supporting Elijah, kind of like she's his um, sponsor, he stays with her, those kinds of things. When Elijah asks what he can do for her in return, she says, I dwell among my people. That is, she has what she needs. Elijah's servant points out that the woman is childless and her husband is old. Elijah promises her a son. She does give birth to a son, but a few years later, he suddenly dies. Elijah brings him back to life by lying on top of the boy, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, and palms to palms, until the boy becomes warm, sneezes seven times, and opens his eyes. In the third miracle, during a famine, Elijah asks his servant to make stew for the prophetic company. A member of the prophetic company goes to gather herbs. He finds a wild vine and gathers wild gourds from it and cuts them into the stew. The men start eating and immediately call out, death in the pot. Elijah asks for flour, throws it into the pot and says to the people and serves the people and they eat. And it says, and there was nothing bad in the pot. Um, you may have noticed that I did not tell you about the last occurrence of Rayim, evil or bad. Well, this is it. Um, there was nothing Rayim in the pot, nothing bad. The one that previously had death in it. Finally, in the fourth miracle, a man brings Elijah food from the first fruits, 20 barley loaves and a sack of fresh ears of grain. Elijah tells his servant, to give it to the people and let them eat. His servant asks, how can I set this before a hundred people? And Elijah repeats his command and adds, they will eat and have leftovers. Um, each miracle, except the final one, deals with a form of bereavement. In the first, a woman has lost her husband and is about to lose her sons. In the second, a woman is first childless and when she has a son, that son dies. In the third, the land itself is barren, the only things growing being inedible gourds. The final miracle is different in that it begins with a moment of fruitfulness, the gift of first fruits, but the fruits are wildly insufficient to the need. In each instance, Elijah works with what is at hand, a jar of oil, his own body, flour, the barley loaves. The things that are missing are not extraordinary things, but the things necessary for life. They're also the things that a greedy royal house puts pressure on by taking for itself more food than people can afford to give away and by requiring the sons and daughters of Judah to work for the palace. The miracle stories are all stories of death and bereavement because there is a breakdown in proper relationships among humans, which in turn creates a breakdown in the relationships between humans, animals, and the land. The broken relationships cause insufficient agricultural yield, human de de debt and death, so owing money and dying, and harmful vegetation. And unlike king after king, whom the Deuteronomistic historian condemns as bad, Elijah is able to heal that which is bad. The bad waters and the bad stew are brought back to health. By so doing, Elijah gives life to the whole community. Elijah's actions create the blessing promised in Deuteronomy, the fruit of your womb, the fruit of your animals, and the fruit of your soil. By taking that which is bad, that which has become bad and healing it. Um, and the miracles may seem small and in a way they are, 
Elijah's miracles are local and specific. He doesn't fix all of Israel's water sources or provide barley loaves for everyone short of bread in Israel. And there is no national improvement in Israel's vegetable stews. But in their smallness, Elijah's miracles display a different way of life from that which the predations of the royal house have led Israel into. For those around Elijah, the miracles suddenly and temporarily show what life should be like under the covenant. Or, to quote the Shunammite people, the woman, what living among my people ought to entail in terms of relationships with humans, animals, and the land. Elijah's miracles preserve a sense of how God's people ought to live right in the middle of one of the darkest spots of the Israelite monarchy. So finally, what can we learn from Elijah? Um, one of the most common criticism of environmentalism today is that environmentalism prioritizes animal trees, landscapes, and so on over people. In particular, environmentalism often leaves communities of color to the side and has little to say about justice between people. And while this is clearly not true of all kinds of environmentalism, it is true enough. And related to this critique, a lot of flavors of environmentalism think of, uh, think of environmental issues and social issues as separate. The protection of an endangered bird has nothing to do with the school to prison pipeline or lead levels in Flint's water. The stories of Elijah work by a different logic. Think of the miracle of the oil. The problem in this story is that a woman is about to lose her sons to death slavery. The solution is a sudden increase in olive oil. The miracle is both social and environmental. We are not told why the woman has so little oil in the first place, but the story's context provides clues. Israel has been experiencing protracted droughts, so agricultural products are probably scarce. Her husband has died, so she has less hands for harvesting. And the royal house places high taxes on the people, meaning that much of what she does ha harvest, she has to give away. It's not possible here to untangle the social and the environmental, questions of justice from questions of ecology. The land is one community of which humans and olive oil are both members. Bad relationships between people put strain on relationships between humans, plants, and animals. Restoring the land means not only thinking of the provision of water as in Elijah's second miracle, but also about how people relate to each other. It means freeing people from death slavery. It means a different vision of how a king governs. It means making sure everyone has enough to eat. Food, justice, and flourishing all go together. And that is why I find Elijah's miracles so exciting and helpful for today. They show that we do not have to choose between caring for human well-being and, and, and environmental well-being. And that makes them very timely. Um, I've had the pleasure of meeting the physicist Radhika Kosla, um, whose work considers air conditioning, um, especially the social and, and environmental questions tied to the increased use of air conditioning in India. I'd never thought I would find air conditioning this exciting. <laughs> so um, Kosla asks whether we need to pit improved quality of life for the many people who live without basic necessities against reaching the temperature goals required to stave off climate disaster. And Kosla acknowledges that it can seem as if development and protecting the environment are inevitably in conflict. For example, models predict that globally, 10 new air conditioners will be sold every second for the next 30 years. Currently, 1.1 billion people face immediate risk from the lack of access to cooling. In other words, air conditioner sales are driven by real need, a need that insisting people live without AC won't do away with. But air conditioners release climate gases further contributing to the heating of the planet, the increased use of air conditioners mean we will live, we will need even more air conditioning in the future. And Costa points out, CO2 lives in the atmosphere for hundreds of years, which means that this, that this increased need for cooling will be with us for a long time. 
So that seemed like a trade-off or a conflict if ever there was one. Um, but Cosma urges us to consider what is lost when we pit human well-being against environmental issues. We lose a moral claim. Morality pushes us to do better in a way that escapes us if we, if we choose climate goals over people. Perhaps we can work both for development and for climate. Costa's suggestion is that we think of city infrastructure as a way to address both. So India, um, much like China, is going through a huge urbanization wave right now. The cities of the future are in the process of being built. What if we build them in energy efficient ways, in ways, ways that consider uh, the relationship between where people live and where they work, um, buildings that are better um, in terms of cooling? Um, what if we think ecologically and socially about built environment um, as a way to improve um, human lives and reach climate goals? Um, this is just one example of how human issues and, and environmental issues are one and the same. A big example, uh, pertinent both to where I am in Vancouver and also where you are in LA, is everything having to do with settler colonialism. Settler colonialism is an environmental issue, a justice issue, and an issue of bad relationships. We won't heal from it by addressing ecology on its own or justice on its own. Truth and reconciliation requires thinking of all the relationships that exist here together. Elijah gave us something like a picture of how that can be done. I may not be able to make poisonous stew not poisonous, but I can attend to all the everyday relationships in which I engage. I can try to bring justice and respect into each of them, treating well people, the things I eat, the land I live on, and the institutions I depend on. Looking at Elijah's miracles in this way, Elijah isn't boring. Elijah so shows us how to live and how to live well. His miracles seem small because they deal with the normal things we need to survive and to thrive. Food, water, tools, family members, community. They deal with what is essential, with the relationships that are essential. And that makes these miracles luminous, exciting, and wonderful. Not boring at all. Okay, that is the end of, of the talk talk. Um, do people have questions? Well, I'm, I'm sure we do. I, I, I have some, I'm sure others might. Um, any questions to start out? Yeah. Um, you were talking about Elijah and you were saying that he brings restoration and healing, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. You and I were talking last Sunday about um, Shabbat, that feeling of restoration or things being in perfect order. So you're saying that Elijah in a way brought Shabbat to each of the areas where they were at when he performed miracles. Yes. So I don't, well, I would have to look. I don't think um, like the word Sabbath is sort of used explicitly in the stories, but um, but that, I think that's kind of, it's like a helpful way to think about it. Um, that, um, that what we see in Sabbath keeping is, um, is this picture of good relationships um, and Elijah is able to live um, sort of as if that is true, even when things are really bad, to like make that real for people around him. I could use another uh, shin word. We could have shalom also, right? Um, yes, yeah. Uh, which is kind of like that, right? There's the same idea of, of, uh, of that right relationship between mm -hmm. all things, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, on the Hebrew note, um, nefel. I just I looked it up, and it's it it's there's a root there of of something fallen also. Sorry, um, what are you? The the word nefel that you were talking about in terms of miscarriage. Shafal. Oh, shafal. Okay, because I yeah. was looking up nefel. Okay. Yeah, nefel means to fall. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, no, so a different root that you're talking about then. Yes. Ah. Okay. 
Um, another shin, another shin word. <laughs> yeah. And no, it refers um, kind of to, to all kinds of loss of offspring, whether or not it's um, like miscarriage or um, it could also refer to like an adult child dying or your animals or yeah. Hmm. Other questions? Could you say something more about, um, I know that, that uh, Jenna, who is sitting in the back row here, who is an attorney, we were talking a little bit just in moments before the service about um, uh, this sense of the biblical understanding of, of as you're saying, personhood um, and, the, and the relationship between all things um, and, and the difference maybe between object and subject, right? I mean, that, that if we don't think of, of creation as in, in terms of uh, this personhood or agents in some way, then they become objects, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so then they're, they're there for our, our uh, use and don't have a, a agency or standing on their own. Um, could you say more about that and what, what your, your thoughts are on, on some mm -hmm. of that? Um, I'm trying, going to try not to babble. Um, so, so I don't think there's a clear distinction between subject and object in the Bible. Uh, it's more like a scale of uh, what things can do. Um, and humans are kind of somewhere in the middle of that. So um, there are very powerful creatures like the sun and the moon um, that have, they have a lot of power because they make night and day, um, which is not to say they're, di they're divine. They just do big things. Um, and um, humans are also capable of doing quite a lot. Um, but we're also very dependent. So we cannot feed ourselves, basically. Um, we need um, plants and animals to feed us. Um, and, and we relate to all, like, all kinds of other creatures. Um, that doesn't exclude use um, of creatures. It's just that those are, use happens within relationships rather than in, um, um, like there's, there's no use that happens without some kind of relationship. So a good example of that is sacrifice. So in order to sacrifice an animal, an animal has to be perfect. So you have to take um, really good care of it. Um, and you can't, in, in Leviticus, it's a little different in Deuteronomy, but in Leviticus, you can't eat anything without sacrificing it, animal-wise. Um, so all meat eating requires a very particular relationship with the animal itself, um, and also a particular relationship with God, right? It happens through the temple system. Um, so there's a use value there. You get to eat it. But in order to access the use, you have to engage in a relationship. Um, there's no option for like the wrapped meat in the grocery store um, or for feedlots. Feedlots just don't turn out animals good enough for sacrifice. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is the, the contrast is not quite between use and between personhood, um, but personhood requires a different kind of use. Um, yeah. And in terms of sort of modern ideas of like personhood and rights, like I don't think the Hebrew Bible tend to think to use rights quite, but like needs and obligations. So everything, all creatures need things, maybe minus the sun and the moon there, they seem pretty okay. Um, and all creatures have responsibilities. So like um, plants, for example, they need water to live and lots of plants in, ancient Palestine would have needed human help because of drought conditions. So like cisterns and terracing and things like that. Um, but they also have responsibilities to provide food for other creatures. And again, humans are sort of the same. We have needs and we also have responsibilities. Does that answer the question? Yeah, somewhat. I, I'd be interested to see if I, I'm gonna put you on, can I put you on the spot? Um, <laughs> as an attorney, how do you, what, what is the status of discussions of um, extending personhood? I mean, clearly, I mean, we've, we've made the leap in the law to fictive personhood for corporations, but for some reason, we're not willing to, uh, to assign that right to, um, speaking of rights in our, in our context, right, um, to, uh, to other things. 
So do you, do you have any insights maybe on that in terms of the law and how maybe this could be potentially a fruitful avenue for um, understanding our relationship to other uh, even inanimate quote unquote beings, water, mountains, uh, I don't know if you can see me. Um, I did take a class in personhood in law school. And I think that we talked about personhood of um, rivers and plants and things like that. And I think there's a hesitation with the law to take these in as persons because then that gives a responsibility to protect them or kind of steward them. So it's easier to say, no, this doesn't have personhood, this animal, this place, this whatever, because then I don't have a responsibility as a lawyer to defend it. Um, so I think that's kind of the understanding that that's left to kind of religious thought to kind of think about what the intrinsic being is for these inanimate things. And, and like, I do think it's, it's complicated in that um, like a tree can't, witness on its own behalf in a human court. Right? Like it just, it, that's just not within trees abilities to do. Um, but I do think from my own sort of religious studies uh, point of view where really I don't have to make anything work in the real world. So take it with a grain of salt, but that, that the kind of way to address that is um, to think kind of more seriously about consent broadly. So it's not like human witnesses that everyone's voice has the same amount of power because of how we've set things up and that consent is quite complicated um, depending on what kind of power you have to speak. Um, and so I th if I think, I think we, if we think about that more, I think the tree question of witnessing might kind of follow. Um, yeah. So it's sort of an issue of voice. But Australia has extended personhood to a river. Um, and India has granted, it's called like partial personhood or somewhat personhood or um, related personhood or something to dolphins. So there are some interesting examples out there, but I don't know if there's actually been actual court cases yet that makes use of it. I was just gonna ask if it had anything to do with agency in, in the sense that these inanimate objects like the tree, like you were saying, you can't do much, but with the river, rivers are very powerful and they have great agency with wherever there is they run. So extending personhood to that and making sure that it's healthy because it has great destructive capability if and so it either is unhealthy, does not provide fish, or runs amok, you know, that you would need to give it greater personhood or agency in order to be able to contain or keep it healthy. Um, so I think actually trees are quite powerful in that we can't breathe without them. Um, you know, they, they um, trees eat sunlight and um, put out oxygen. Um, so that's, that's important. Um, but I think that you're right, that it is like about agency. Agency is sort of a complicated word, but um, in that it tends to assume some sort of brain. Um, but I think if we put that aside, um, then, then yes, like I think it's, it's about figuring out how to express that agency in terms that make sense in our legal system, which is not really set up for that. Um, and I think that that is hard, um, but I think that you're right, that part of it has to be about recognizing that, um, that rivers, for example, do exercise all kinds of agency over our life. And I think like thinking about the Colorado River that now doesn't quite reach the border, <laughs> like it's just gone um, because we siphon off so much water and the communities whose whole life have just been, like their whole life has been tied to the river that now it's hardly there anymore. Um, you know, that is a very 
like powerful expression of agency in some way, but legally we don't talk about it like that. We talk about water rights or um, how much water can this community draw and how much can this community draw and yeah. So um, I have a few very random observations, questions. One is, of course, that in the U.S., corporations have personhood, which, you know, <laughs> and what you make of that. But um, I had heard also that in the Middle Ages that occasionally animals would be put on trial. And I'm not sure how widespread that practice was, but it, it implies that they had a different idea of the agency of, of an, the animal world. Uh, and then, like in our own time, fields like my, especially like mycology, are just sort of questioning individuality itself. Like, what are the boundaries of a human being? If we're just this symbiotic, you know, relationship of fungi and bacteria, and what even is an individual? So, just a few random observations. Well, and I didn't, I didn't talk about this, but part of, part of what tends to be different about animism is there the that it tends to have no like um there tends to be less a sense of the individual as a um um kind of contained unit um so for example there's a, a canadian writer um um Sorry, there's two that have the same last name. Now I can only remember the one with the wrong first name. Uh, hold on, I'm just going to Google it. Um, um, Leanne Simpson. The other one is Audrey Simpson. Um, but in her book, As We Have Always Done, um, which is about indigenous resistance, she talks both about... Um, bodily sovereignty like everyone has bodily sovereignty and about community but there's no sense of contrast between those two it's not like you have to like figure out how to weigh individual sovereignty against communal responsibility like they are one and the same which i still really struggle to understand because i think as a, as a european um like the right of the individual and the right of the community is often in tension um but um but that's just not the case in her writing. Um, yeah, so thinking about the individual differently, I think is a big part of it. Would you be able to text us the author in the in the book to which you're referring uh, or put it in the chat? Yeah. And then Kelsey can take it down to put in our resources. Um, as you're doing that, I mean, if you can chew gum and talk at the same time. Um, the, um, oh, okay, okay, first of all. Um, this may be like speculative, but absent like an Elijah figure that heals or does something to make us right, what would you say would be like the spiritual or I don't know, biblical solution now? Like, and it's art, it could be argued that we're like so out of relationship with nature and ecology and everything. Like, what do what do we now do? I guess. And that may be kind of an unfair question. Oh, so I well, I mean, I don't have like the like magical solution, but I think um I think that sort of like really straightforward thing is like to attend to um the relationships that are most clearly um broken where you are. So like, I just moved to Vancouver um, and there's sort of two, I think two sort of human relationship issues that are really clear here is, so I'm on Masqueen land. Um, you know, I, I don't have much relationship with the Masqueen people and yet I live on their land now without sort of asking or, um, you know, it's basically the settler colonialism thing. So like, attending to that relationship. And then um, if uh, you've done any reading about um, anti-Asian hate and um, the wake of COVID, Vancouver really stands out as like particularly bad. Um, and so thinking about um, how to address um, uh, hate and violence against the, especially the East Asian community here. Um, and, and I think, you know, we're not super good at connecting human issues and environmental issues, but I think 
starting with sort of like, okay, so how do we make better relationships between communities that really don't know how to relate might show us in that process how to also um, address the environmental issues. Like I really do think bad human um, relationships um, sorry, my husband said I'm talking too loud for the child to sleep. <laughs> um, he's texting me. Um, that bad human relationships support bad environmental relationships. So they're going to be different relationships depending on where you are, but that's where I'd start. Um, I might go inside since they are in there and then I'll be further away from them and I won't keep the talker up. But while you're moving, um, I, have a, I have a question about animism. Mm -hmm. um, and I understand how you are using the term and it seems it's very fruitful in, in terms of the, the relationship between um, humans and animals and, and other uh, what we call inanimate object, um, mountains, trees, water, etc. cetera. Um, but I think that, that sometimes people might have the misunderstanding of the use of that in terms of um, that all of these things are, are um, gods or um, something like that, right? So, um, it, which I don't think is the way you're using the term. And so could you say something a little bit about, about that? Because we, we, I think when we think of animism, we think of perhaps a different uh, understanding. Um, yeah, so, um, hold on. Um, so put in there, head legs. Um, so, um, um, animists differ as much as anyone else um, in how they think about gods. So, um, like some, some, Animist communities have beings um, we would recognize as divine, like kind of outside the normal world, um, and some don't. Um, and that's kind of aside from animism, like it's not it's kind of neither here nor there. Um, in terms of thinking of like trees as something you relate to, um, that doesn't make trees any more divine than humans you relate to so it's that kind of relationship like it's not um assuming um like divinity or semi-divinity or anything like that it's just you can relate to trees just as you can relate to your neighbor um yeah so it's different than pantheism and sort of seeing divinity everywhere does that help Yes, it does. Yeah, because um, I can think of when people you hear the word, they may immediately load it with all sorts of stuff that I don't think you're intending. So mm -hmm. um, I think that's helpful. All right. Any other questions or that one thing that that uh, I'm struck with is is a story that. Um, uh, your teacher Ellen Davis talks about uh, when she came across the um, a mountain in I think it's um, maybe someplace in West Virginia or something like that that on the outside from the street looked perfectly fine but on the other side of it um, was strip mined and totally left um, barren mm -hmm. um, and so I think that that when, when we think of the devastation of the land uh, and, and especially the, the role of the land in the Hebrew Bible, in the, in the Old Testament, um, that, that I think, you know, that, that really brings up this notion of, of, of uh, personhood or what we would consider in our, in our language rights, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, and so this is a, a total violation um, of of the land. Uh, and in fact, it, it reminds me of, I think it's Jeremiah 23. Is it Jeremiah 23 where he talks about 
um, I think it's the 23rd chapter, Jeremiah, where he talks about that, you know, the land is, is uh, totally devastated and, and uh, the water is no more and everything is polluted and, and no life is left in it. Um, and, the, and that's both a punishment um, on the people for their uh, lack of, of justice uh, and righteousness. And, um, but it's also probably the outcome of the works of injustice and in like, like in this case, right? Um, I mean, that, that's sort of rambling, but maybe you might have some sort of response to those sorts of ideas. Um, yeah, so um, the, well, it's hard. It's always hard to say something that's true of all biblical texts, but very often um, when sort of unfruitfulness or agricultural devastation or um, other forms of um, like landscape um, death happens, it just it's both punishment and consequence, but those aren't really um, those are like one and the same. Um, so there's not like um, kind of an external punishment imposed. It's like the, the outcome of your actions is the punishment of your actions. Um, and it's not, but it's not always quite clear. I just don't know that those two were as different to people. And so it's not easy to untangle them. Um, and um, well, and Ezekiel is a really interesting example in that the, suffering of the land there is both described as a punishment of the people themselves and on the land so the land faces judgment um which it's it's hard for modern minds to at least mine <laughs> to understand that the land itself can fail in ways that um are similar to how humans fail i think i think you know the, the reason i'm raising that is because what i've been thinking about more recently is this idea that of, 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 you know, quote unquote, divine punishment, we think of as some sort of external force. Um, whereas it's really, um, we bring the punishment on ourselves uh, and that the land in its, in, in, in nature and all creation in its prophetic voice is going to rise up uh, and is rising up um, in judgment. Um, and, and the punishment will be uh, on, on us because of our own actions and not as if, you know, some like force from outside is going to, to do something about it. And we're, we are the very um, vehicle of our own punishment in one sense because of our actions. Yeah. And, and the difficult part of that is, so the sort of positive, parts of the version is everything needs each other. So there's interdependence tying everything together, which sounds really nice. But the, the difficult side is um, that sort of consequence as punishment is fairly imprecise. So um, um, you may not be the one who is personally responsible. So in, in Kings, the, the blame is primarily put on the royal house, but everyone suffers. Um, and that's the kind of flip side of interdependence. You can't have interdependence without risk to everyone. So sort of unfair, but also just how if people need each other, then if one part fails, then everyone feels it. If this has been something that has been acknowledged for a really long time, the necessity for stewardship, the necessity in biblical times of letting a field go fallow so that it can heal and so that it can produce again, um, the Sabbath, the idea of the Sabbath, a day of rest, people need the day of rest. And this is not something that's specific to Christianity or Judaism, it's also throughout other cultures. It amazes me that in modern times, for some strange reason, we don't seem to think that that's still necessary. I mean, mm -hmm. this has been wisdom 
that has passed down and ultimately in the long run is more profitable mm -hmm. because you don't destroy a resource. Mm -hmm. You allow it to rest so that it can then be fruitful again mm -hmm. and produce good things. So I, I don't get the mentality that that would not factor that into your, you know, your corporate plan. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's just a good point. I think extraction is a um, value of empire. Um, and by that, I mean that empire wants always to extract uh, the highest yield and benefit. Um, that's sort of an imperial value. Um, and our economic structure uh, does that as well, right? So, um, so we are coming to the end of our time, but... Um, yeah, you know, that, that's sort of like kind of a downer to leave. Well, so if I can, <laughs> if I can turn that. <laughs> so, well, so I just thought that was a really good point. And there's this really lovely um, Instagram account called the Nap Ministry um, that is um, uh, um, Black women napping as resistance. And it is beautiful. So, um, you can turn that point into a everyone should go and look at the nap ministry and be inspired to practice sabbath for resistance so are you going to give us that link too so we can uh, uh um, if you just search for the nap, nap ministry on instagram um, ah. they will come up oh well, there it is the nap ministry wonderful great well mari um, thank you so much for your time with us today um and thank you uh, for having me. I know you're trying to do a million things at once, uh, even right, even as we speak, we hear in the background. So uh, that's a wonderful thing. That's that's hope right there, right? Hearing hearing that wonderful sound in the background. So thank you for being with us, and uh, uh, we look forward to perhaps uh, speaking again sometime. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having me. Okay, bye for now. <laughs>